Hi everyone, my name is Kelly Klinger. I use she, her pronouns. I am with the DC Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Um, and I'm here today to um, discuss with you all uh, um, about rooting our responses to domestic violence and equity, trauma-informed practices and referrals to resources. Um, so as I said, my name is Kelly Klinger. I'm with the DC Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Um, I just also want to give the an, uh, um, acknowledgement of um, a colleague that I was working with that um, could not make it today. Uh, she also helped um, put together this presentation. So this is her information as well. Um, and this is just a quick CME statement. Um, and there are no financial disclosure, disclosures for today. Um, and today, um, after today's discussion, we hope that the um, pediatricians will be able to identify warning signs of domestic or of possible domestic or intimate partner violence, formulate approach to inquire about the children and non-offending parents' safety using survivor-centered trauma-informed practices, um, and assess for best practices, um, best service providers in the area, and assess for health in inequities that may impact the accessibility for services. Okay, um, so I am coming on here with the understanding that most of you would have a basic understanding of domestic violence. So this is just a very brief overview. Um, and I do welcome anyone to come off mute or write in the chat for any questions you may have um, or any discussions or thoughts that you would like to add. Um, I really hope that this can be interactive and useful for your toolkits. Um, so here explains the basics uh, definition of domestic violence, a pattern of course and abusive behaviors. Um, to maintain power and control over another person in an intimate or dating, formally dating or family relationship can be also referred as um, intimate partner violence or um, family violence, gender-based violence, and it affects everyone um, of all ages, educational backgrounds, races, religions, and these are reasons that it's not caused by poverty, lack of education, alcohol, and or other drug use. Um, and here just shows some of the common statistics of domestic violence that one in four women and one in seven men will experience domestic violence in their lifetime and 20 to 25 percent of children witness domestic violence during their childhood. Um, and here just shows some of the uh, disparities and the differences um, in different marginalized communities. Okay, here um, I just want to focus on the dynamics of domestic violence um, and some of the warning signs and red flags that you may see in your patients. Uh, aside from the bullet points here, just want to give the opportunity of anyone else can think of other warning signs or uh, behaviors that they have noticed in past experiences working with clients. And so just looking at some of these bullet points, we think of jealousy, um, you know, what that could look like is having if let's say if the perpetrator is at the um, appointment with the family, um, they, he or she may be jealous if the doctor is of this opposite sex or gender of the, the victim or the patient. And so they may not trust the person being in the room alone with that, just the doctor without the um, spouse there as well. Um, I am trying to be very cognizant of using just gender bias terms um, because we know that this can happen to anyone. Okay, so um, in the comment and uh, in the chat, we had visible injury. Yes, that is correct. Um, and vis visible injuries like a bruising or um, swollen, uh, swollen somewhere on the body parts, and it's always 
good to try to inquire about that, um, never to assume it was an accident. Um, you can probably see that most in like playful or use of force and sex um, or threats or use of violence. Um, and so these are some of the red flags and warning signs. We'll get more into uh, details of how uh, this can affect, uh, how this can look like intimate partner violence, domestic violence. So here uh, we have the possible signs of trauma. Um, I often just look at it from four different perspectives and that's neurological, psychological, emotional, cognitive, and uh, physical. Um, so in so in neurological, you know, we think about the fight, flight, freeze, or fun, um, and how they may respond if they are in a moment of flight, flight, or freeze. Um, and a psychological, emotional component would be um, it, shown here with anxiety, depression, if they feel like they can't be alone with you without the other person, or they might be expressing um, symptoms of depression, problems regulating effects like laughing when something is not funny um, in a situation because they're nervous, uh, cognitive if they're unable to think for themselves or organize their thoughts. They might have forgetfulness of dates or injuries of how that may happen. Um, and they might have a difficult time making decisions without the other person's consent um, in the room. So like the abuser or the perpetrator making the decisions for them. Um, and um, as someone mentioned in the chat, physical body aches, so they're talking about swollen pains where you see some bruising um, in certain areas that may not be as common or of concern. Um, those are definitely signs to keep aware of. Okay, and so focusing on possible signs of trauma in children and adolescents, um, these are some signs that we have gathered together. This is a working list. So there are many other signs that can be possible. Um, and the biggest important thing I would like to point out here is to be able to really look at it from a trauma-informed lens. So a child who has just experienced trauma in the home or in the neighborhood, um, in their family versus a child who might be just acting out to seek attention or going through their behavioral changes of an adolescent and learning how to properly behave. Um, so what I mean by that is like, we see here, it talks about like loss of interest in school or friends um, that they may have enjoyed in the past. So that's just kind of inquiring with the child, like how things are at home, how things are at school. And if you notice a difference of like a withdrawn or how they are saying, um, you know, I don't really see this person anymore. We don't, I don't really invite my friends over. Uh, those are conversations to kind of lead with and figure, uh, point out then if maybe there's possible domestic violence in the home or concern in the home for this child. Um, and the lack of sleep. So if they're talking about maybe the reason they're not sleeping well is nightmares, ask about their nightmares. Um, ask them, you know, do you want to talk about that? What are your nightmares? And then from there, you might be able to draw uh, more information. Um, and anger. Um, so anger if in both adolescents and children, if they seem to be uh, irritable when you're asking questions or withdrawn um, and outburst and maybe asking experiences of like how often they feel angry or what makes them angry. Uh, if they talk about a friend making them angry or parents saying, asking like, where did you learn this behavior or, you know, where are you mimicking this anger? If they say, well, dad's angry or mom's angry or some caregiver is angry at home, um, that's usually a sign to kind of take a moment and reflect on maybe what's going on in the house. Okay, um, 
So it's very important to be able to identify um, the non-offending parent, and that's someone who um, who is on their offending partner is the one inflicting harm on them. Um, and usually the goal of this is to try to be able to get them in a safe place for disclosure. Um, and to do that, try to create, um, create that space. So if you are in the room with the child and the parent, um, that's okay. You know, the goal is not to get disclosure. The goal is to be able to open that um, doorway for them to have that conversation if the person feels like they are ready for a disclosure. And some practical points that you can ask and leading up to that could say, you know, I have begun to ask about um, all the parents in my practice about their family life and how it affects the health and safety and that of their children. May I ask you some questions? Um, or violence is like an issue that unfortunately everyone today um, that affects everyone today. And so I have begun to ask families in my practice about exposure to violence. Can I ask you a few questions? Um, making that a regular standard will just show that you're not isolating and pointing out just them, um, that person. And so that way maybe that can create some dialogue and then they can may feel comfortable to disclose. And if not, um, if they don't disclose or say anything, you can say, okay, well, here are some resources that um, we just have available out in the front waiting room or here. If you would like to take some with you, please feel free to do so. Um, if they are saying that they would like to disclose, but they're just uncomfortable with the child in the room, um, just offer, if you can, a space for the child to go somewhere else or create a time for a disclosure um, at a later time of the examination or um, at a later date that would work for the family. Um, and some here you see some communication strategies for the child um, would be like play therapy, um, art therapy, discuss healthy teen uh, conversations and relationships. Um, so with that, you can say, you know, I don't know if this is a concern for you, but many teens I see are dealing with violence or bullying issues. So I started asking violence about um, asking questions about violence routinely to all my patients. Um, and then you can also say, um, sometimes when I see an injury like yours, um, it's because someone got hit or hurt. Um, how did you get this injury or bruise? If that's, if you see like a physical sign of injury. Okay, um, so uh, healthcare and domestic violence, it, it actually creates a space for survivors to um, disclose. Uh, this gives them the chance to be away from their home and away from the abuser. And so you see here 30 37% of women who talk to someone um, about the abuse or is typically a healthcare provider. Um, and so they, it shows that there is an increased disclosure in the healthcare setting. Um, and so with that, it is very important to be mindful of um, the systemic injustice that may happen in that workplace. Um, you want to be able to be as inclusive and culturally specific as possible. Um, you know, there is the term of like medic, uh, medical gaslighting, and we just want to make sure that um, that doesn't happen and we don't create our own biases or um, stereotypes about a certain group or um, marginalized community or culturally specific stereotype that we may know of someone or culture. Um, and just understand that domestic violence may not be a topic that is accepted or talked about in a certain culture. Um, so in order to be inclusive, uh, these are some of talking points that we have um, provided here of making sure that you have language access, um, making sure that the information is clear and concise um, based on the language access um, and you want to avoid dehumanizing language, meaning you want to use uh, person first language 
Um, you want to make sure that it is a space that they feel comfortable disclosing to someone. Um, so here I have mentioned earlier about uh, medical gaslighting, which occurs when someone in the medical professional field dismisses or uh, minimizes the person's symptoms um, or, or experience. Um, so we know that people of color may have higher rates of domestic violence and uh, due to get medical gaslighting, they may feel less likely to uh, disclose or follow up with their medical care. Um, and so to do that, you wanna, to avoid that, you want to be able to build trust um, and be mindful of the stereotypes and the past racial inequities that some cultures may have been facing. Um, and things to consider in your organization and your place is like subsidized and costs uh, net, cost and cost and network. Uh, think about co-pays and how that may affect someone of low income coming to see to seeking help um, and then offering like a slide and scale, which I know most medical places do, but making sure that your place, your medical place does or offer that and how it can be revisit the policy around it if it needs to be adjusted to help accordingly. Um, so here uh, we want to focus on like health equity and what that looks like. And we want to start it from a systemic level. Um, it is important as you as an individual to not have your any biases come through to your client, but also you want to make sure that your workspace is also accessible and your client feels comfortable coming to this space. Um, so here we have this like graph. Um, I know it's a little hard to see. Oh, whoops. Um, and with that, it just shows that as an organization, it starts with the organization itself. And with that, you want to look at like, how do we get to a space that is inviting and that it's a, a self-assessment. Like how can we make sure that our programs are effective? How can we make sure that our, our co colleagues and coworkers are upholding that respect? Um, and how is our data transparent? Is it working? And then when you go on past the organizational level, you wanna look at offerings. Um, you want to look at what you, what your agency can offer to the community, um, what products, language access, um, brochures, pamphlets, um, safe, secure environments, um, and how do you use like a human-centered design? So that's another point to look at. And then you move on to community. You know, how do you transform your offerings to make sure that you can recruit and operate and invest in the most equitable health outcomes? And then from there, you look at the whole ecosystem. You know, who are your suppliers? Who are your vendors? Are they diverse partners? Are they um, equitable? Uh, how does this impact your work? How does it impact the overall message of the organization and how you can build relationships and provide that advocacy? Um, so these are four domains that you can take a self-reflection and look at and make sure that you in your organization is upholding this type of dynamic. Okay, so I, I just really quickly went through all that um, statistics and basic information of domestic violence. Um, here, I do want to focus more on a person-centered approach. When you are working with a client and you're able to identify warning signs or you were able to, um, or there was a disclosure. Um, and now, how do we connect to the survivor? Uh, these are, you know, what are some approaches you can do and how you can put this into practice, into your toolkit. Um, so a person-centered approach recognizes that each individual is unique and is, an, is the expert of their own experience. Um, we cannot always assume that someone who went through domestic violence experiences the same pain or 
symptoms as another survivor. Um, everyone is affected differently. So it is person specific um, and knowing that we cannot predict that they are going to behave or act this way. Um, we can have the basic understanding of a survivor may not want to disclose right away or may not want to or cannot leave their abuser right away, but we cannot assume that that is the situation for every uh, survivor. Um, so the first thing we want to do is be able to offer building choice um, and then flexibility in the screening and exam process. So I just want you to think back on how you typically do your screening process and think how someone of the LGBTQ community or any other marginalized community, how that may impact how you do your regular routine. And just think about how can you be, um, how can you make that approach center to them? Um, and then think of how after that, you know, your next steps, you want to think about how, what best resources are available to them. Um, you want them to feel like they, that the choice is theirs and that they have um, the autonomy to decide what to do next. As we know, survivors who are in this uh, situation, their choice is often stolen from them and they don't get the choice. So we want to let survivors know that they have the choice to move forward, they have the choice to do this and how they want to move forward. And doing that is just having a very simple conversation, almost like a peer to peer conversation, rather than telling them or educating them saying you need to do this, you should do this. Statistically, this happens. Now you can say like, this does affect everyone. So how can we what do you think is best for you to do? How can we move forward? Um, some techniques, like I said, just um, be mindful of how they want to be presented, their name, their pronouns. Um, you want to introduce yourself if they're if you're new to them um, or what they can expect, especially after a disclosure. Um, ask them how they want to receive the information, if that's through mail or email, we want to be mindful that the other person may have access to those medical records, especially with children involved. Um, and so is an email safe? Uh, is sending a letter safe? And was their preferred method of communication? Um, and just making sure that they feel comfortable in the space that they're in, um, in the room, and they feel comfortable for a disclosure. And then informed consent, just let them know of the um, mandatory reporting laws and then what you would do with that information, who has access to all the medical information. Okay. Um, and how to support survivors, you just want to normalize the screening process and asking questions. So that refers back to, you know, we, um, I asked this in all my families and all my patients and then going on from there, how, how they may have gotten that injury or how things, how the family dynamic is at home. Um, and then you wanna validate them. You know, you if they don't want to provide a disclosure or they're just saying like, no, no, this, this bruise was just from something else. Don't argue, um, just say, you know, okay. And then provide resources regardless. Um, you wanna be able to say, you know, these resources are available. Um, should you know anyone going through um, any violence or should you just want to educate yourself? Um, you don't want to make them feel guilty for not wanting to disclose or make them feel like they're not telling the truth. And if they are in a situation where they do disclose um, and just respect that disclosure, um, don't have judgment um, and ask about their immediate safety. Um, ask them how, if they're safe right now, is it safe to go home after this appointment and what you can do and how you can help support that decision. Um, are there any questions as of yet? Um, any questions specifically about how to support survivors um, or a scenario that you would like to share and get information on? I have a quick question. Can you hear me? 
Yes. Yeah, this is Mia. Um, I just wanted to know what would you do if a family said that they weren't safe? You're in the clinic, you're seeing a family, um, you've done the screening, there's some things that you're concerned about, and they don't feel like they have immediate safety. Um, yeah, so there are um, there are a lot of resources in terms of uh, shelters and uh, placements. I do understand that maybe a shelter is not the most um, best option or the most desired option for the survivor, um, but definitely ask first about, you know, are they looking to leave the home and give them information about resources for places to stay. Um, I have that in another slide coming up. Um, and, or if they, you know, they can't leave, that's okay. The best way to go about that is like to safety plan with the survivor. Um, so that can be looking at, okay, if you do have to go back home, um, how can we safety plan? Uh, having them create an extra overnight bag and leaving that somewhere with a trusted member or having that somewhere discreetly, if they have their own car, if they can leave it in the trunk of their car um, or leaving it somewhere with the family. Um, the, being able to provide a safety plan catered to their needs will help create that safety in the immediate feeling. Um, and then it can help them maybe build up that courage or that planning um, to seek a safer place. Does that uh, answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'm just reading here. Um, there was a question raised in the chat and said, in the scenario where the parent has been able to leave, um, a domestic abuse situation. However, the child has had a traumatic witness event leading to regression. How does one find resources here? Um, of course, yes. Yeah. So, oh, I'm just trying to close the chat. Um, so we have, um, in terms of for children and their safety, we have resources here of the national hotline um, and the helpline of re, um, the have children specific play therapy um, counselors available to help with children. I, I know if there is like a disclosure, um, I can't speak on behalf of um, Child Protective Services and how they, um, their process, um, but it's always important to be able to connect with them um, and learning more about what are some of their reporting laws or what is their process? Because I know that is a big question of like, if I call CPS um, and I report the family, what does that look like? What are their next steps? Um, and you wanna assure the, ch the child and the family, it's not their fault um, for disclosing and that they're not gonna get in trouble for disclosing. You actually want to thank them and reassure them that it was safe to disclose right here and that this was, um, appropriate to do so for their safety. Okay, you're welcome. Um, so I have these, I have these um, resources here. Um, so the National Helpline, the website, and there's 24 hour confidential hotline numbers where they can speak to an expert advocate. Um, available and so here, you know, aside from pamphlets and brochures that you may be able to provide, um, the family can inquire, the victim survivor can inquire more when they call and ask questions um, and asking that survivor, if they want to be present with you when you call together. So it doesn't have to feel like such an isolating experience for them. Um, they have just confided in you and built that rapport. So if you have the time and the capacity to do so, it's making that call with them. Um, and here we have uh, materials and support. So the, this slide will be provided to everyone um, to be able to go through the links here provided. Um, at the last section here is my organization's website. And we have a lot of member programs within the 
DC community uh, that can help support children specifically, that can help support survivors. Um, some are culturally specific, uh, and a lot of these resources are free and available. Okay, I am looking at the chat um, and the contact information for the Child and As Adolescent Protection Center at Child National um, has a therapy program for children exposed to domestic violence and their survivor programs. Um, so the email was provided in there for referrals. Um, um, yes, yeah, so it is important to be able to have this information um, and to look through the resources of what's available for um, adolescents through specific counseling, play therapy. Um, it's really important that we create that space for the child and the adolescents in the room you're in with them, saying it's okay to disclose. It's okay to share anything you want with me here. Um, because they're at home, they may be told, you can't talk about this, you can't share this with anyone, um, so they don't think it's okay. So reassuring them, saying, you know, I can be trusted, you can tell me what's going on in the home, um, it might help that dialogue and lead to them knowing that this is a safe place to disclose. And if they don't do it at that session, at that check-in appointment, you can definitely follow a follow up with them in the next session um, or appointment. Um, and being consistent throughout each time you visit, you you have these check-ins. Um, if the same family's coming back a month later, be consistent saying, you know, how are things still in the home? Like I said, I still ask these questions with all of my clients. Um, has there been any changes? And going on from there to really normalize the question of asking about violence in the home. Um, that's what we really want to do is to be able to normalize that question and it's not just geared or directed so they don't feel like it's a um it's on them or that they are being targeted for a disclosure do we have any other questions any other scenarios Um, and I will make sure that the um, therapy program that at the Child and Adolescent Protection Center, uh, that contact information will be included um, when the link is sent, the slide is sent out for everyone so they know where to send in referrals. Thank you, Kelly, so much. This was a, a great presentation. Um, and Keith, we'll be able to get these materials out to everyone, right? Yes, yes. Um, and like I said in here, oh, trying to, uh, I will include what I'm also going to include is um, um, the PDF for like more about domestic violence, the power and control wheel. Um, if you check our, our website specifically, it has a whole list of like 19 member programs in our um, area for specific domestic violence programs. Great, right, thank you. Thank you, I'm just checking the chat, making sure I'm not missing any other questions um or concerns so i'm going to stop sharing my screen okay <laughs> um and i actually have um a quick um survey if you guys would be able to fill that out it's completely anonymous and voluntary um if you have the chance to fill it out it's just for me to know um how I'm, you know, how we're doing and how I can improve on my presentations. So I'm going to put that here in the chat. Um, 
And then we can also send that out an email if you were present today to be able to fill it out. All right, and I can make sure that that's also distributed and available to everyone that registered or participated today. Um, I'd also like to put in a plug for our fall symposium on October 20th. If you uh, are receiving our newsletter, which I hope everyone is, um, you'll hear more about our fall sym symposium uh, on October 20th from 6 to 8 p.m. We're going to go a, a little bit deeper on this topic and invite some of our community partners in to have discussions with those in attendance at an in-person live event uh, to learn more about what resources are available and you know how to have conversations, how to refer people to resources, what actually happens when you identify um, someone uh, that's in a situation and may need resources. Um, so uh, you'll probably see Kelly or our counterpart there again if you want to talk to her more about uh, their organization, as well as some others. So just watch our newsletter for how to register for that. Again, October 20th from 6 to 8 p.m. And if there are no other questions, thank you, everyone, and please have a good day. Did somebody try to jump in? Maybe somebody signed off. Okay. Everyone have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. It was great.